welcome everyone to the talk show here at the 92nd Street Y. <clears throat> you know, tonight at the 92nd Street Y, we're going spycraft, cloak and dagger stuff, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Real spy stuff. <clears throat> in fact, when you walked in, you realized you didn't realize what that was about. You were given all code names. Right? <laughs> Sir, you're Mordecai. Your wife is now Wonder Woman. <laughs> she likes that. He likes it more. <laughs> uh, and there's a reason for those code names, because we're here to talk about uh, one of the most truly spectacular uh, examples of Israeli, uh, Israel's agility with espionage. And, and ironically, for most people, they don't realize <clears throat> it was its very first experience in international espionage and counterintelligence. Uh, the abduction, the kidnapping of Adolf Eichmann uh, that led to the trial uh, in Israel. Uh, <clears throat> it was um, the first time that the world marveled at, at Israel's ability to pull off such daring do. Uh, it was also the first time that the world focused on the Holocaust, because the Holocaust itself <clears throat> and the, uh, became a, a part of the world's focus, the uh, Israeli justice system, uh, and its rule of law became the focus of the world's interest during this time uh, in, in putting a, a mass murderer uh, uh, on trial. This is a special event uh, tonight that's honoring this show that's, ba that's here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, uh, Operation Finale. Uh, and I think you might have actually received a ticket for a pass. Did you all receive that? Yeah. You should have. Don't miss this. This is an amazing show, this exhibit, and we're gonna talk about it tonight. We're just gonna give you a, a tease tonight of the show. Uh, in fact, it was extended for about a week or two. Uh, until next week. Until next week. So you have an opportunity this week, and, I, and I hopefully at the end of this evening, you're gonna to say, tomorrow, I'm on my way, unless they're closed. Um, uh, it's, it was, the, the show came about because the documents, the artifacts about the Eichmann abduction and the trial were recently uh, declassified uh, by Mossad. And uh, this gentleman here to my right, this incredibly charming man, uh, very extremely personable, uh, Avner Avraham. I, it wasn't until I met Avner Avraham that it dawned on me that a spy could be that personable and charming. I just, I didn't, they I never, teach them to be that. I, I didn't know part that. Of the now, if you treat me nicely, I think you're a spy. Uh, because this guy is an incredibly affable, charming man. Uh, he, for many years, was uh, a specialist <clears throat> in, in computer science and counterintelligence uh, intelligence for the IDF. Uh, then he served in uh, a very similar capacity uh, in counterintelligence for Mossad. And then somehow became transformed into a museum curator. Uh, we're going to talk about how it was that this entire show was assembled by him. Uh, all of the documents and artifacts that became declassified, as well his own efforts like Indiana Jones searching the world for ways to tell the story of uh, the Eichmann kidnapping. So uh, he's also, he's, he may mention this, I'll show a photo, he's going to be a movie star. Uh, because Operation Finale... I'm already a movie star. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, wait till after tonight. Because it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, this Operation Finale is being made into a film by MGM, uh, starring Ben Kingsley as Adolf Eichmann. Uh, and Avner Avraham has two scenes uh, yeah. at a restaurant, and he's always in the right spot. I don't think. Restaurant and the courtroom. In the courtroom. So you'll see Avner, and you'll say, aha, I see that's a cameo yeah. by the guy who came up with this whole, all the artifacts. He served as a consultant on the, on the film, and he's an enormously interesting guy, and the show is largely based on his efforts uh, introducing you to Avner Avraham. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and on the other side of Avner is a person with exactly my last name, uh, Eli Rosenbaum. Um, uh, Eli and I are not related, although we call each other cousin. Uh, and uh, uh, if you didn't know of him, you should. Um, because, you know, we oftentimes invoke the words Nazi hunter, but there's actually only one person that I actually know. It's Eli Rosenbaum. For over 30 years, uh, Eli has been the longest serving prosecutor of Nazi war criminals in the world. Uh, and <clears throat> 
And we could, in fact, do an entire show of just going over the cases that Eli handled uh, for the Office of Special Investigations here is an arm uh, of the United States Justice Department. And he has been running this department through the Justice Department, uh, this ent his own entity, the OSI. Now it's called the Human Rights and, and Special Investigations. But it's- Though it's, I don't run that, but yes, but, I'm there. <laughs> um, but that's, that's been uh, <clears throat> Eli's role for many, many years. And so he's gonna clarify some of the issues here and maybe we'll talk about some more recent uh, cases. Uh, if any of you have read an earlier one of my novels, Secondhand Smoke, uh, the character Bernard Ross is completely based on him. In fact, Bernard has a mustache too. Uh, <clears throat> and I don't know where that came from. Uh, before we talk about the show, there's actually one person in the audience whose name I would like to acknowledge, although he's gonna be really furious at this. Uh, we're living in a time of s s true scarcity of great men. Uh, but my friend George Klein is one of those great men. Uh, he is, in fact, the founding chairman of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, and he, in fact, is a major donor for, to this exhibit, Operation Finale, Mr. George Klein. <laughs> now, he's the kind of guy, don't flash a light on him. He's the kind of guy who's extremely humble, and he's gonna be really mad that I did this. So when you all leave tonight, everyone's gonna have a big smile on your face. You're gonna say, that was an amazing night. There'll be one guy mad, it'll be George. You'll know him. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's, uh, Operation Finale, even the title makes sense. Why? Because the, euphemistically, the genocide of the Jews was called the, uh, the final solution to the Jewish question. And when the Mossad came up with this, project, this mission, they ironically used the word Operation Finale as if to say, no, this is the finale, the abduction of Eichmann. Uh, briefly, a little summary for those of you who haven't followed this case recently or know very little about it. Uh, Adolf Eichmann was, in many ways, the architect of the final solution. Uh, he was the person responsible for the deportation and transportation of Jews to their death. Um, for those of you who have bought into Hannah Arendt's argument, The Banality of Evil, Eichmann in Jerusalem, please throw that book out. It's utter nonsense. And if you think I feel this way, <laughs> if, if you feel I did, don't talk to my cousin Eli, because he goes <laughs> really crazy. Uh, Eichmann uh, was driven uh, ideologically, emotionally, psychologically uh, to kill Jews. He was, no, he was not just a cog, he was not just a bureaucrat, he was not just an accountant, uh, he was not just part of the system. He was motivated to kill Jews. Uh, there was nothing banal about his efforts. It was pure evil. Um, in 1948, uh, after the war, uh, Eichmann uh, manages to escape from, the United, uh, uh, from captivity. The United States had captured him. He escapes. He ends up for a bit of time in Italy. He goes back to Germany. He's under various different aliases. Uh, he ends up with papers that have him now as Ricardo Clement, and in 1950, he moves to Buenos Aires. Uh, two years later, his family joins him, and the architect of the final solution is now speaking Spanish in Argentina, and he's a rabbit farmer. I know, he's a rabbit farmer. He ends up becoming the manager of a Mercedes-Benz dealership or something, but at some point, he starts out, uh, I think he's a water engineer at some point. Uh, in 1957 uh, and 1958, the Israelis realize that he's there. Operation Finale is in motion. Uh, he's kidnapped two years later. Uh, he's drugged, uh, put into an El Al flight, and sent back. We're going to show you some really cool images about things that you, none of us really knew until Avner brought them to light. Uh, the Argentines, of course, uh, file all sorts of protests. Uh, with the United Nations because of the invasion of their territorial sovereignty. The trial takes place in 1961. Uh, it makes headlines around the world. It's televised around the world. It's the very, very first time that the world confronts the Holocaust. It's the very first time that the Israelis confront the Holocaust. There are 100 witnesses that testify, all of whom are Holocaust survivors. The Israelis had never heard from these people before. No one ever actually was able to speak. The Eichmann trial pushed people to speak. Uh, 1,500 documents were submitted during the trial. 
Uh, Eichmann represented himself, although he had uh, two lawyers uh, provided for him. Um, uh, the United Nations, the protest with the United Nations actually ends up in a, a sort of an agreement with Israel because they did in fact kidnap an Argentine citizen. Um, uh, the, uh, the verdict is ultimately uh, uh, finds uh, Eichmann guilty on 15 counts of committing crimes against humanity. We'll talk a little about some interesting pieces about the trial, hopefully, with Eli. Um, in, he's sentenced to death by hanging. He's, he's hanged in 1962. Um, it's amazing when you think about the legacy of, of the Eichmann trial. Uh, I'm going to talk to Eli. Even his job, the work that he's done, no doubt, has some legacy. The piece of what happened that the world's consciousness is, this is what you do. This is how you ultimately judge people who have committed mass murder, that you don't just pretend it goes away. It doesn't go away, uh, legally, morally. Um, Holocaust uh, oral testimonies, Holocaust memoirs, uh, Holocaust art and culture, Holocaust movies. All of this is really the legacy of, uh, of, of the Eichmann trial. Uh, it opened up the world's consciousness in all ways, ethically, psychologically, morally, culturally, journalistically. Um, so that when you think about oral testimonies, really the very first effort of that was that the world watched Holocaust survivors with numbers on their arms testifying against a man in a glass booth, a bulletproof glass booth. Um, so though, and we'll talk a little more about, but that's sort of the brief uh, summary of what you need to know for today. Uh, so Avner, let's start with you. We're going to show you some really interesting slides. Um, Again, I'm just giving you a sample of this because I want you to go see the exhibit, right? I don't want to give you too much because it's just so fascinating, the documents, but this is a tease. Avner, let's just start with you. You, you start off as a, a career computer scientist, a person whose real job is a true spy craft of how to, make, how to find people. Uh, so you have some skill, but you're not a trained historian. No. H how did you end up becoming the person that would put, and there's even a better example. This is not your only show. There are, there's another 20 of these? 25. 20, 25. After this, this was so successful, Mos, the Mossad decided we should showcase all of our great exploits. And there's your guy. He knows how to do it. So the raid on Antebi, right? All of this is now, Avner has curated all of them. So how did this happen? Seven years ago, I found in the Mossad uh, archive some few boxes with uh, all the original stuff from the operation. And it was exactly 50 years after the opening of the trial. And uh, I decided uh, to do a small exhibition in the Mossad headquarters building. And uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu came and he saw the exhibit and said, hey, it should be in the, in the Israeli parliament in the Knesset. So I got a phone call from head of Mossad. You should go now. Your mission is to go to the parliament and stay there one month. So I, I went to the parliament. Did you change? Did you make the exhibit bigger? No. I came to the to the parliament with the, with the core of the core of the exhibit, and then the people from uh, Beta Tfutzot, I don't know if Shula is still is here, Shula Bahat. Uh, so the people from Beta Tfutzot came and uh, offered me to build a professional exhibit. And it was a big success in, uh, in Tel Aviv, the Museum of Jewish People. And then um, a rich guy from Cleveland came, <laughs> Milt Maltz, and told me this exhibit should, should come to the state. So we built the exhibit for 5,000 square feet. To take it on tour. Yes. It's very important to know that the exhibit includes the, all the original stuff, the original documents, the passports that Eichmann used. Which you'll see. Everything, yes, everything is there. And if you've, you will come, you have the only chances to come during this week. I will be there. I will try. If you come there, maybe I'll give you a special tour, OK? <laughs> yes, maybe we'll arrange one day or after the, the, the end. Anyway, so this it, is was, it was a big success. And so, but but, but it, it changed your career because yeah. you are no longer an official Mossad agent. You are now basically taking these exhibits around the world. I start, uh, they uh, allow me to uh, interview to the media, but they mention only my, uh, the name Avner A. 
A. Avnel. That's I why saw an article in, in The Guardian where yeah. you were listed. That's why I, I bought the aavnel.com. It's very smart. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> every time, every single, uh, every new information about the operation, I got every, almost every day a new. Like six months ago, I found out there is a movie that Fred Berger, that his father is here now with us. Good evening. And he got baby, by the way, Fred Berger, the producer. <laughs> and um, I saw I saw article about it in uh, in Deadline, and I just sent email to the journalist. I told her you must connect me with Fred Berger, and I met him in London, and I became the chief Mossad consultant. I just came from Argentina after three months together with Michael Aronov, that Ooh, is he's, here. He's, Michael Aronov is one of the actors yes. who's going to be in the new movie. Right? Yes, he's playing, and and by the way, I, I can I can say that I, I was in the trial because I was with him outside the courtroom. He played, and I was extra, but I asked to be in the front. I asked all the. You always ask <laughs> the photographer. I can't imagine him yeah. doing that. You have to ask the photographer, <laughs> where should I be if I want to be in the in the in the frame? And by the way, when they when they build the Mossad See, headquarters. This is a spy. I'm just saying. This when, is a spy. Yeah, when they build, when they build the Mossad headquarters for the movie, yeah, they ask me for uh, names to put on the doors, and they said the first name will be your name. So when I came at the first day, I asked where is my office. They told me it's there. So I asked the photographer, the camera will see it. He said no. So I asked to uh, change move. the movie. Yes, it's yes. Right. <laughs> so you will see my my name there. No, but I I, I want to say seriously that. Making a movie is like a Mossad operation, but at the end of the day, uh, instead of dead body, you got movie. Okay. <laughs> but it's the same. Thank God. All right, yes. let's, let's take a look at some of these, uh, uh, these artifacts and documents. And again, I'm going to run through yes. them. Avner will tell us what, what we're looking at. Let's see. This so uh, let's see. so let me just say, this. Yes, it's important to know, and Eli's going to dispel some of the myths about how Eichmann was ultimately uh, abducted. But j like a Hollywood movie, uh, this is, begins as a love story. Uh, this is a Romeo and Juliet story where Juliet's <laughs> father's Jewish. Uh, and here we go. Here's Romeo and Juliet. Start. So Ben-Gurion, Prime Minister Ben-Gurion, didn't ask to bring Eichmann. It starts with a love story in 57 in uh, Germany. And this uh, lovely girl, Sylvia Hermann, uh, she grew up in a, in a Christian German family, but her father was half Jew, a Holocaust survivor. And she went to a German film festival and she met this guy, uh, Nicholas Eichmann. And the, the Eichmann family used the same name. They didn't change the name. So Ricardo Clement didn't name his children last no. name Clement. No. He kept it Eichmann for the yes. children. So, so this is the oldest dating. son. Yes, so the, this is the oldest son. And you can see the picture. This is a spy picture you can see in the corner that we made a picture uh, uh, from a suitcase. You, can you see, see also the, in the, movie. the outlines. Yes. The photograph is shot from a suitcase up. So this is the beginning of, of, uh, of the story. And uh, of course, Nicholas thought, thought that it's a German family. And he spoke right. very freely. S Yes. So, so then what happens, this is her father. Yes, this is her father that he sent from this, uh, this box. A mailbox. A mailbox. He sent letters to, uh, he started to send to, uh, Lothar, to Dr. Fritz Bauer. In Germany, who's a prosecutor in Germany. Yes, and he was also a, a Holocaust survivor. Because, the, because what happens is the father hears the name Eichmann. Yes. The father's half Jewish, and he thinks there's something not right. And he's, then he basically, doesn't he tell the daughter to go conduct surveillance or something? When, when they start uh, uh, sending letters to Fritz Bauer, Fritz Bauer told them, you should go and try to, to, to check the address in Chacabuco Street. And, and when, when, when uh, Lothar Hermann starts sending letters to the Mossad, he said they gave, the Mossad gave him a, a post office box here in New York. And someone from the Jewish community used to go every day and to find if there is an envelope there, he should put them in another envelope and send it to Tel Aviv. Okay? So that's why I said there's a lot of people that are involved in the operation. And the reason and for that, know. among other reasons, is that he didn't want to be seen as mailing something directly to Germany. No, Germany or Israel. Or Israel, for yes. surely not Israel. So he was mailing something to New York. 
in order to, so, because his life would have been in danger, because he had figured out that Adolf Eichmann's son was dating his daughter. This is just nuts. Okay, yes. let's go. <laughs> right, this is how this gets done. Now, this is, event, this is the, not the Garibaldi Street house. No, this is the house in Chacabuco. So this I, is the I meant, very I meant first it. house. Remember, the people always remember that Eichmann was kidnapped from Garibaldi Street, but he originally lived in this house. Yeah. And this is actually a photo of the house the yeah, way I it made this photo uh, two months ago. But what hap but happened was he ends up leaving this house. And why is the reason? Why does he move from this house? The family just uh, bought a piece of land in Garibaldi in San Fernando. OK, so we lost him. Yeah, we lost so him. all of a sudden, the Eichmann picks up and goes. We have no reason why. He leaves, and Israel thought they had him. By the way, Argentina, if you've taken a look at a map, it's huge. It's a big country. So if you lose him, you can really lose him. And so how, tell the story about how they found him again. OK, so uh, first of all, this is Fritz Bauer, the prosecutor from Germany on the left. That's the photograph of Eichmann on the right. Fritz Bauer uh, took from the uh, German archives the, all the, the documents that belong to the SS file of Eichmann, and he leave it on his table. And the Mossad agent entered to Frankfurt and made a copy of all the documents, and we use it to the trial and for also for the capture. So he doesn't officially give the documents no, to No, he Israel. just forgot. He basically says, he just, just come to it. my office, and I'm going to go have a sandwich. Yes. And he goes to get a sandwich, and they take photographs of the entire file. Now, Bauer is Jewish. It's important to remember. Yes. He was, a, a, at that point, I mean, he's actually a guy you really respect, right? He's a hero. He's uh, a hero. I mean, he risked his career uh, and potentially his life to do this. And Frank Fritz Bauer wasn't when we did that event on Labyrinth of That's Lies. Right. There are two, Holly, two, not Hollywood, but two German movies There's two uh, about him. If you in the saw last Labyrinth of Lies, Fritz Bauer was depicted. He has a big part in that movie. Yeah. That's what he actually looked like. And I knew he was a hero of Eli. I, I should add that uh, uh, although he justly gets so much of the credit for what ensued, uh, it, it eventually came out that he uh, had authorization of the prime minister of the German state of Hesse, where he was right. a senior prosecutor. And uh, people who know me uh, know that I am not um, uh, one who is inclined to give uh, post-war Germany a lot of credit, uh, but I think credit is due. Uh, uh, because they were willing to release the file. Yes. So that's the file that the Germans have on the right that still that they have. The Israelis now have that. And with that. Left ear. The left right. ear. The key here is the left ear, because yeah. you know how you watch CSI now? That's not how they did it in 1958. Remember the in 1958, left ear. the left ear is the key, the key thing. Explain yes. this. Well, we'll I, will, I will talk about it later, but right. just remember the left ear. OK, so here, <laughs> here's the spy craft, everyone. Yes. Here's the Leica camera. On the right, you see this, the, the, suit, the suitcase, the briefcase. Can you see there's a hole in the front? Yes. There's a hole in the front. Let's see if I can in right the side. there. There we go, right there. Yes. That's a hole, and the camera is in there. And so, and apparently, <laughs> Avner explains, this is not so easy to do. So when you show up a bunch of times, they took a lot of shots of nothing. You know, so they have to show up again to keep shooting to know how to put the suitcase briefcase in a way that you can actually get a face. It's, it's important to, to say that it's uh, ironic that uh, Michael is playing. The Mossad didn't have a lot of money, so they sent only one agent with this camera. And he needed to develop the picture, try to, to explain what is to develop the picture. Yeah, let me tell you something about Argentina. And there's a th what a backwater country. 1958, no CVS, no Dwayne Reed. <laughs> Nothing, not a cell phone, nothing. They have to go there and get it developed. They have to develop and wait a few days for the film. And by the way, Florida, it's in, uh, this uh, uh, Photoshop uh, was in a Florida street. And I went there. I tried to find. I asked the, the neighbors if they know something. Because I, I thought maybe the, the shop is already there. And maybe I found archive. And I don't know. And um, he developed the picture. And if you continue, yeah. we can see. Here's the, I love this, get ready. Okay, here we have Tria Aroni on, on, on the right side, together with Nicolas, with, no, with, with- The youngest. No, with Ricardo Eichmann. Ricardo Eichmann is the youngest, he born in Argentina. He named him Ricardo over for his name, yes. but he gave him the Eichmann, of course. Yes. That's the youngest Eichmann child. And it's a famous meeting that they made maybe uh, 15 years ago in uh, Europe, 
Today he is against the Nazis and he is against uh, his uh, whole family and uh, just just to be clear, yeah, yeah, it's clear. Let me see. Did I lose you? Wait, sorry. Go uh, forward. Yeah, go forward again. So. The yellow. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Sorry. Okay. Yes. So uh, here, uh, this is this guy. He's now a professor of archaeology in Germany. He here he is as a little boy, and now tell us how we find his older brother again. How we found him? Well, no. How did we actually locate I, where, the, where the family was on Garibaldi? Ah, okay. So, so when Ironi came, he came to the house in Chakabuka Street, and he found an empty apartment, and he, um, he saw uh, two workers there that told him the family just left, but one of the sons was, is walking in the garage next door. And uh, in the SS file that uh, we, we got from Bauer, we found that uh, Nicholas Eichmann got, got a birthday. So, you know, in birthday, you should buy a gift. So the Mossad uh, bought a gift for <laughs> Nicholas, <laughs> and they gave it to, the, to his brother, and they, they followed the motorcycle, and they found the house in Garibaldi Street. And, uh, because they brought him a birthday gift. Yes, and then they came to Garibaldi Street, and they, they took some, some uh, people from the Israeli embassy and some local, uh, yeah. local uh, Jews from the Jewish community, and they came and they asked him if he know who is the owners of the lands around because they want to buy a lands and to make uh, industry use. And after the capture, they asked him if he felt something wrong. And he said, yes, when you came and told me you are going to buy here lands, say something that doesn't make sense. It was a bad cover story. But here you can see uh, uh, down, you can see the picture that the Mossad made. I only made this picture. So this is the photo that they get of Eichmann through yes. the briefcase. On April 60, one month before the capture. Uh, one month before the capture. Here's his file, SS photo. Yeah. Uh, and so they were looking, they needed the left ear. Yes. So this is, this is the document from the Israeli police laboratory that compare the shape of the ear. And they found that it's the same guy. So only in this point, the uh, operation is starting. And here we have uh, the team. This is the actual team yes, this is the actual that did the, were responsible for the kidnapping. You see there is a woman. By the way, you know one of the uh, visitors here today, one of my friends, he is the grandson of Israel. Yes, the, the, but the person who led the mission. Itai, where are you, Itai? The, 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 top, person who, the top right hand corner. Itai, sir. yeah. Right, so this, was the, this man was head of the operation and his grandson is in the room. This is Isser Harrell. But this, to, to the, to, yeah. uh, but, but all of these, most of my these. Research, my research is based on uh, personal connection. You know, for me, Itai is agent. Yeah. If he finds something in his in house, the, in he, the attic. He, sent me, he sent me new details. So I have a, a close uh, uh, relation with all the families, Family. relatives. Now, many of these are Holocaust survivors. Yes, yes. And right. the only one that's still alive is Rafi Etan. Yeah. I'm sure you know him from also from Jonathan Pollard. Yeah. And, uh, and if you go to the museum, you'll actually see some wonderful footage of him today. Yes. Right, document. Uh, yes. Um, OK. All right, let's see. Uh, it's important in this picture. <laughs> yeah, let's, I like this. Th that the secret, no, but the, the, the one before, yeah. the secret, one of the secrets of the Mossad that we all look different. My parents came from Iraq, from Mosul, OK, in 51. And I look like Iraqian. I speak Arabic. You look from you, your family? Iraq. No. <laughs> Lansman. Okay. No, I'm a Pole. I'm okay. a Polish Jew. I, okay. Do and you, you have, have to ask me that? And you have, you Everyone have, knows I'm a Polish Jew. You have other languages? No. Only I'm an American. Okay. <laughs> I, so, I'm ignorant. I'm an American. I speak one language and not even that. So these agents come from home with Romanian, with, uh, with the German, with... Uh, different languages, and we use it as a weapon. For yeah, but, us. but no one spoke Spanish. No one spoke Spanish. <laughs> I think that's a key thing. Everyone looked different, but not one person spoke one, which is why the moment, the moment when Avner says the local Jewish community actually was indispensable, because they, they were sort of in on it without really being in on it. They were sort of leading people around and showing them, and you know, you had a good cover. You had a local Argentine, and they speak Spanish, and they help w usher around 
the team. One, one of them, uh, Avrum Shalom, that was the head of Shin Bet, um, he came with a fake German passport. And uh, all the agents came from, in, in the different days, different airlines. And uh, he came with his German passport to Argentina. And uh, he got a reservation in a small hotel and the reception and he saw a German guy. And the German guy saw a German purple and said, oh, the brother from my Holy Land. So he said, where are you from? He said, yeah, I'm from Germany. And where in Germany? So he gave him, of course, a small of a very small village. And he told him, come on, I'm from there. <laughs> <laughs> I told you the agility that the Israelis had to think fast on their feet here. So he told him, I, I don't want to talk about this village anymore because it, uh, the, the woman there break my heart and, <laughs> and I don't want to go there anymore. And don't talk with me about it, yes. Now here we have Israel, the head yeah, of Mossad with the fake El Al. Um, so this is the head of the mission. And the head of Mossad. And head of Mossad. He's yes. the head of Mossad, of course. And, and he became engineer in El Al. <laughs> but all of a sudden, here he's being shown as an El Al engineer. And what I love here is Aflula is not even at the time a city in Israel. Yes, and he right. born in Aflula that established only 15 years after. Right. But it's okay for, for the Mossad. <laughs> it works very well. All right, let's, let's, let's talk about some other things. Um, um, if they had had the information about this Romeo and Juliet love story in 1950, Israel, I know, but if it was 1950, yeah. they couldn't have done this. I think it's important to point out that the trial is in the 13th year of Israel's existence. It's like a bar mitzvah gift to the country. Uh, they have the trial. Uh, you know, this is their first big operation. It took Israel a while to even be able to, it just, it's an interesting confluence of events because they would, it would have been too young a country, I think, to pull this off. I mean, you see, this was their first operation. They're using very crude, although who knows if the CIA had anything better than a Leica camera. Uh, th th let me say, I've seen the CIA documents on this, and we actually made them public. And what one finds in those records is uh, statements of astonishment that uh, Israel was able to pull off this mission thousands of you miles. You mean their from own the, assessment? The CIA was amazed. And what they mostly wanted to know as a matter of, of spycraft was, how did you pull it off? And the well, Israelis wouldn't tell them. So it, it is interesting to think about that this is their first mission. And I have some questions about the sub subsequent missions, since Avner at this point is an archivist historian of Mossad missions. It is important to have keep in mind the context of when this was done uh, so soon after. I mean, it's only 10 years after liberation that they find that they have Eichmann that they see where Eichmann is. Um, uh, and all of a sudden, the chutzpah, you know, that we're, we're, we're going to go get him. I think the other thing that's important that I want to talk to uh, Eli about later, that it was only in 1950, two years later, that they passed a law called the Nazi Crimes Punishment Law, which said, if we find a Nazi, we're going to have this underlying uh, substantive uh, uh, legal principles that we can prosecute him. That Although they were the, actually thinking so soon as if we're going to catch these guys, maybe not today, but at some point, so at least let's make sure that we have subject matter and personal jurisdiction and underlying substantive criminal law. Although the, the assumption was, when they passed the law, that it would be available for use against Jewish collaborators who came That's to Palestine and then Israel, where they never imagined the lawmakers who enacted that law that, they, that Israel they could would ever it. get its hands on a real Nazi war criminal. Well, let's talk to Eli about this part, and maybe you can help dispel some myths, because uh, they've been out here for a long time. And now that the, the documents are declassified and Avner has made them available to the world, what is now true? For many, many years, people believed that the CIA was aware that Eichmann was in Buenos Aires and that they withheld this information from the Israelis. For many, many, many years, people believed that the West German intelligence network also was aware that Eichmann was in Buenos Aires. And not only did they not tell the Israelis, they didn't extradite him themselves, because at this point, they too were thinking about, it's our it's crimes against our people. We're the country that's responsible. That's what the Frankfurt trials were about. Is any of that true? Did the United States know about Eichmann and where he was? Did West Germany know? There, there are kernels of truth to all of that. Um, 
there is strong evidence that West German intelligence learned in 1952 that Eichmann was in Argentina and they learned uh, of the individual um, who knew uh, what his alias was and they could have pursued that. But, but didn't they have it Clemens? They had it wrong. They had the name slightly wrong. It was Clemens as in Roger Clemens. Right. Yankee fans don't discuss that yeah. much anymore, but as in Clemens. Um, but they had a, a solid lead and could have found him. Um, Simon Wiesenthal learned the following year in 53 that Eichmann was in Argentina, shared it with uh, the Israeli Consul General in Vienna. Vienna. It yeah. wasn't pursued by the Israelis either. The CIA was told in 1958 by a German intelligence agent that they understood that uh, Eichmann may have lived in Argentina, that he might, believe it or not, now be living in Jerusalem, highly unlikely. Um, well, wasn't that the same report that said that he was born in Israel? Yes, the same erroneous report. You know report you don't have a good report. If your report says that Eichmann was born in Israel. Right. Uh, but the odds, of course, of Eichmann <laughs> living in the 1950s, either on the Israeli side of Jerusalem or the Jordanian side, were between slim and none. Um, but uh, the idea that the CIA withheld that information from Israel is, is simply ahistorical. It assumes that the CIA had some reason to believe that the Israelis would act on that information. And as I said, it's clear that the CIA was as astonished as the entire world was. Also, as, as we know, even Ben Gurion's cabinet, the Israeli cabinet, was astonished to learn right. that the Mossad and, had captured. And, and, and so will take us. Impor to important to say that uh, you mentioned that the family joined him in '52. Yeah. And if the family came, they got a green light to come to Argentina. So that's why maybe the Germans knew for the, maybe for the first time that he's there. Yeah, but there's also something that I read, I think it's something you wrote actually, that one of the boys was told in order to uh, dupe the family into moving, that we're moving to a place that there'll be so much open space you can ride horses. So the Germans somehow report said that this was northern Germany, right? The idea is, yeah, well, where, where in Germany can you ride horses? Northern Germany, right? That was Wiesenthal's actually in, in oh, that was easy. of it. He went from believing oh, correctly right. that Eichmann was in Argentina to concluding, right. ironically, on the on the eve of the Mossad apprehension yeah. of Eichmann in Argentina, that no, yeah. in fact, Eichmann was in, in Germany. Well, that actually really comes to my next Eli Rosenbaum question is the story about Wiesenthal. Uh, many of you may know who Simon Wiesenthal is. I mean, I'm telling you who the real Nazi hunter was. That's Eli Rosenbaum. <laughs> Uh, but Simon Wiesenthal took credit for giving the information to the Israelis for decades. And Avner knows that that's not true. <laughs> and you know that that's not true. And in fact, even, uh, even Wiesenthal initially denied that he, and then all of a sudden, what happened? He decided to, mm -hmm. he changed his story and well, decided because the Israelis would never cop to it, he'll take credit. As Avner and I have discussed, and you and I as well, there was this void, this informational void after the Israelis startled the world by announcing in 1960 that they had located and apprehended Eichmann and brought him to Israel. The Israeli government really didn't want it known at first how this had happened. Uh, they didn't even want it to be known that it was a government operation. They were happy to have people think that maybe well, these were independent operators. In fact, they said it, the reason that you can't judge us at the UN is that these are private citizens. So into that void uh, stepped Mr. Wiesenthal, who deserves our gratitude and admiration for so many things. But Without, not this. But not this. This is the case that made him famous, but he really had no involvement in, in the actual and, locating or and, apprehension. And as you pointed out, I forgot, it was actually his letter cable that said that he thought Eichmann was in northern Germany riding horses with his kids. Can I interrupt yeah. with just one point? The, the, um, the slides are wonderful, but um, they, they don't really do justice to the magnificence of the exhibition that yeah. Avner has put together. You have together. to see it. I saw this last year when it was in, uh, Skokie. Uh, in Skokie at the uh, Illinois Holocaust Museum. I saw it again here when it was brought to New York by the Museum of Jewish Heritage and uh, Beit HaTfutzot, the Museum of the Jewish People in Israel, two of the world's premier museums. Um, it's mesmerizing every time I see it. You have only one or two weeks left. But you can if come you to Florida. 
You yeah, never St. Petersburg, yes. St. Tampa. It has yeah. one more stop in St. Petersburg, Florida. Who would want to go to Florida this yeah. time of year? So this I mean, is your chance. Especially not <laughs> now. Uh, I'm going to go to more uh, yeah. documents, but can you just quickly tell us whatever happened to uh, father and daughter, uh, rec uh, the, the, the Eichmann, the, the Romeo and Juliet story? Well, Did they, they stay moved, in Buenos Aires? They, they moved to other places. Because they were scared? They, yes, and, and they send, the, and they send uh, Sylvia. And as far as I know, she lives in the state. And she's, she's still alive, maybe here in New York. I try to contact her and she don't want to, the family, I, I, have a, I have a connection with the family. I met them in Argentina and they don't want, uh, they don't want me to, to meet her. Um, they also said, they want to, ch they try to change the history and they said she was only 12 years old and it was a love affair, but it's not true because I, I have all the documents. And mm. All right. Uh, this looks like a modern bus and a modern bus station. It is, but in fact, it's... It's the line that Eichmann used, the, the bus that he used every day when he came back from home. He got a routine, and routine is a very big uh, enemy because if you come every day at 7.30 and you use the same bus, the same bus station, so the Mossad is waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that... So, yeah, so it's very easy. So you just wait for him 7.30, and, and he don't show up in the, in the day but of it, the capture. But it's important to remember that even today in Buenos Aires, it's still bus 203. Yes. You know how the yes. 104 Broadway bus? It's the same bus. And the, and the bus the same, station, yes. And that's the same station that, uh, that Eichmann was at. Now, with, you'll have to see the movie for this, but some of you may have known this part of the story. Uh, there's really, it's very dramatic that the, the actual abduction, very famously, a, the most famous chokehold in the history of the world, Peter Malkin, <laughs> was famous for this chokehold that he puts Eichmann in. Uh, the idea, right, was that uh, Eichmann gets off the bus and then he walks to his house. They stake this out. There's two cars waiting for him, both Mossad. My memory was that one of the cars was supposed to pretend that they had trouble yeah. under the hood. Uh, Peter Malkin says to Eichmann, uh, sir, do you know if you can help me with no, no. this? Actually, three yeah. of That's the most famous words in law enforcement history before Malkin, may he rest in peace, I got to know him, jumped uh, Eichmann. He said, un momentito, senor. <laughs> I'm going to the, put you in a that headlock. That was the last thing Eichmann heard before yes. he got there. Momentito, so. senor. That's un momentito, right. senor. So, but, but I also told, was told that Eichmann felt he sensed something. Right, did Malcolm say no, no, that no, no, no. he didn't send something? No, 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 they, they put him in the car. Uh, put so they the choke car. hold, put him in the car, yeah. uh, but the key thing to keep in mind is that on this day, one day, Eichmann's late. Yeah. He doesn't show up at 7.30. Yeah, he didn't show up, and uh, they decided to wait until 8, and of course, like in the Hollywood movie, he didn't show up because he late. I now I remember the, the scene with Ben Kingsley looking at the sky, and the bus is coming. And, uh, he forgets he missed, to get on the bus, yeah, he Ben missed, Kingsley. Yeah, he missed the bus. We don't know what out of Eichmann, why. The, you think he was at a meeting or something. But he, yeah, it was a meeting. Uh, so a few, few minutes after eight, he, he showed up with the next bus. But they decided to stay. They decided to stay, of course. They had a sense that he's coming back. Yes, and uh, so they captured him, they brought him to the safe house, and uh, they start, uh, of course, immediately they saw that his name is Ricardo Clement, and they start asking, what is your name, Ricardo Clement? But even in the car, I understand, when they knock him out, they're looking for scars on his body. Yeah, Rafi, yeah uh, yes, Rafi found the scars. And in the he, back seat, yes. they're like, they're, they can't even wait to, to confirm this. Yeah. So they start looking for scars on his body. And they're so excited by this. Yes, they, they, yes. they take him to the safe house. They end up staying 10 days in the safe house. 10 days and... Uh, Seven days longer than they wanted. But, but when they question him, they ask him like a half an hour, Many, many questions. He was so tired. And they told him, what is your number in the SS? What is the, your soldier number in the SS? And he said the real number immediately. Like, like I asked you what it is. Yeah. And he said the real number. And that's why. And he, then he said, my name is Adolf Eichmann, and I would like yeah, red, they, red wine. Right, right. <laughs> he <laughs> apparently asked him a bunch of questions. And then they finally throw in the last one. What is your SS number? And then he gives them this. And then he says, my name is Adolf Eichmann, and I like red wine. Uh, this is, uh, 
let's see, this was his Mercedes-Benz um, uh, ID, and this was his local ID for Buenos Aires, right? Um, let's see, oh, I love this. <laughs> so these people, tell us who these people are. First of all, we know the, the evil, uh, Mengele. Well, we'll get to, yeah, I don't want to bury them. Yeah, we'll talk about Mengele. Mengele's on the right back. Yes, right. but uh, here we have uh, people from the, uh, from the Israeli <coughs> embassy. Uh, that Some of them took part in the operation. They, they work in Argentina. They worked in Argentina. The, the, this picture is from the But they're Israeli. Israelis. Yes, Israelis in, from the Israeli embassy. And but they don't know what's going on. No, they don't know. And uh, Israel uh, stayed a lot in the, in the embassy. He used to sleep there also. And he used to come every day and ask someone to help him with something like the sick guy. Yeah. You want to mention him? Yeah, no, we're going to definitely do that. Yeah, we'll do it. We're definitely going to do that. But, but Israel knew that, Aichma, that Mengele is living in Argentina. He got the address, and he came to the safe house, and he told the team, let's bring Mengele in the same plan. They said, no, it's too dangerous, because Mengele will ask for one big name for one big trial. That's okay, all. So this is super important. They actually know <laughs> that Mengele is living in Buenos Aires also at the same time. Yes. And I mean, this is extraordinary, right? Because everybody's thinking, well, how are they? Everyone thinks of, mainly think of Paraguay. It's, they're actually neighbors, essentially. In fact, that on the house is the kind of house that Mengele yes, was. This is one of, this is one his, of, his first house. In, this is where he would have been. Not the house in, in 60, but it's the first house in Argentina. Right, and so it's, in fact, it's Ben-Gurion who says, we just want one. Yes. We want to do one trial. That's why the Mossad the, the, the one that tells Mossad what to do is the prime minister until today. And uh, Ben-Gurion uh, said, I want one, one Nazi for one trial. I don't want to see, I don't want to hang people in Jerusalem. One is enough. And everything that, uh, every trial that you do after, it would be far away from the big trial. And look what happened with uh, ben -Yanyuk. You have right. connection to Oh, are you I kidding? Know. Not to that part of the debate, no, no, but right. yes, yeah. later on. So, so you, you were going to say something about Mengele, Elon? No, just to, to make sure that everyone who's here or watches this on the internet uh, knows uh, he was the notorious experimenter and selector of angel the Auschwitz. Of death. The angel of death. The angel the of death. death camp. And, if, and, and, it, and was and, celebrated in many Hollywood movies, from and, The Boys of Brazil, Marathon Man. In the, in the 70s, he was probably the most wanted fugitive in the entire world. And many people would argue, uh, Eli would know more about this or care more about thinking about that one might think that, would you think that Mengele would be a more important target? No. You still think Eichmann was the they guy? They made the right call. Ben Gurion made the right call. He was a target just for killing. Not right. to bring him for right? Well, that's but, an important point. We have to talk about the distinction between, you know, I don't know if people in this room think, well, what's the relationship? They could have just shot Eichmann in the head when he gets out of the bus but, and go home. But instead, they go to this incredible, and we're going to get to this in a minute, the difficulty of getting him out of Buenos Aires. This is really what the sequence of these. But it's important to say that Israel came to the embassy and said, hey, can you help me? You come tomorrow. Don't come to the embassy tomorrow. Come with your wife. A basket with fruits and wine, and I want you to see it in the front of the house. He didn't tell him it's Mengele, and I want you to look and spend all the day. And then he asked other guy from the embassy, can you dress with the overall, and you like uh, work in the telephone company, and I want you to enter and check this house and knock at the door. So it's amazing. I mean, today we don't do it today. I mean, we don't. We are very but, far from the embassies. But it is, it's, it's, it's interesting because the, and we'll talk about that, the Mossad stayed. By the way, all of them, cultural attaché. It's amazing. Yeah. 32 cultural attaché in the embassy. Now, this, this is interesting because El Al plays a role in this. Yes. Uh, they didn't know that they played a role in this. It just so happens that in 1960, Argentina has its 150th birthday. And the Israelis decide, Ben-Gurion decides, this is our cover for the Eichmann abduction. We, we are going to send an official delegation of Israelis with Abba Iban, our foreign minister, to celebrate Argentina's birthday. And that plane is going to take Eichmann back. Yes. Am I right? That's, yes. that's what they did. There's Chutzpah. It was the premier of Olal. Now, Abba Iban has no idea this is happening. He it, thinks he's there for the birthday party. It was the first flight for Olal, <laughs> and it was fully booked because the Mossad bought all the tickets. Yeah, but, the, but, there, 
But there's nobody on the plane yeah. except for the delegation coming to the birthday yes. party. Yes. And we're telling the Argentinians we are starting a new route. Yes, new destination. New destination. This is tremendous. The Israelis now will be flying to Buenos Aires. Yeah. And this was, this was the ruse. Yes, and you know, the second flight was two months ago with Netanyahu when he came. <laughs> yeah, so this it took a long time for that. that <laughs> uh, Abner, you should tell them how they got Eichmann onto the plane. Yeah, we're going to do that. We're yes. going to do that. So okay. this is important because this woman was head of LL in Buenos Aires, yeah, yeah. not knowing what she was doing for a living. Yeah. She, she worked a few years in El Al, and she came with her husband, you can see, and the, <laughs> small, and the small kid. And they, they lived in Argentina. He was an engineer. He works in a local company in a very nice house. And she got a phone call from El Al. Would you like to be the manager of our new lovely destination? Even the one that called her didn't know that it's all fake. And, and she arranged everything. She also asked. And these are other friends who yes. work. These women no. all are work for El Al. No, no, no. They, they came with a plan. These pictures is when, uh, when the crew came with the first plan. Uh. They landed. And uh, they made uh, some shopping. Yeah. No, it's, <coughs> so, 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 so the kidnapping happens. It's 10 days. There's a delay. This is the part that Eli definitely will want to talk about. Uh, oh, oh, this I love this photo. Oh, yes. Let's okay, go back. So, so here you have to see, because you all know what Abba Iban looks like in the front. Here they are celebrating Argentina's birthday with these Mossad in the safe house trying to figure out when to get on the flight to go back to Jerusalem. Right? And it looks pretty official to me. You wouldn't know. The Argentinians would not have thought that this is that there's a scam going on. By the way, you, you missed the big party that the Mossad arranged in the same day of the capture, on May 11. It was a big, par a big party for the, all, all the military attaché in, in Buenos Aires. And even the American uh, attaché, uh, the American military attaché, took part in this uh, uh, party. And it was the alibi for our military attaché that took part in the war. <laughs> right, because otherwise, why yeah. would he be on yeah, the plane? Yeah, because he was in the, in the party in the same time. So and, so, and there was a big search, I'm sorry, a big search for Eichmann, right? The family went to the police and said he's been kidnapped. No, 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 they didn't. I thought they did. No, 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 no oh, they I didn't. Not yet. No, they didn't, they didn't go to the police. They tried to find First, them. they did it with the German emigre community. They found the glasses near the bus station. Yeah, I mean, the they bottom. knew that yes. he'd been kidnapped. They just didn't know what to do about it at the time. This is really my, this is my favorite photo. Okay, Can you explain so this? So this is very important, because you have to explain, how do you get Eichmann passport and get him out of Buenos Aires? Yes. And this is how you do it. And first of all, I, I, mm. I want to say I, I'm very proud that I, uh, the director, Chris Weitz, agreed to change the script of the movie and to put this scene. And on the right side, on the upside, you can see uh, a Shin Bet agent. And he looks like this because they told him, you are the only one that looks like Eichmann. We are going to change the color of and your hair. And do that smirk. Yes. The so, smirk so like it's the same guy on the right side. And he enter. This as, smirk as is remember. this smirk. He landed in Argentina with the Lal, and they just took the passport and replaced the picture. And you will see this scene in the movie also. Yeah, and also they darkened his hair. Yes. Right, because he's really on the bottom here. This is really what he looked like, right? Yeah. So they darkened his hair. He was the more closest. So how do we get it, get him on the plane? Here, let's do this. Ah, okay, this is so, how we get him on the plane. So the idea was to bring him a sick, like a sick crew member. Now, if you are sick, usually what do you do? If you're very, very sick, you go to? Uh, go to a hospital. Park? You need a hospital record. Hospital, yeah, right? So Israel wake up in the morning, and he saw the first guy in the embassy, told him, I want you, when you come tomorrow to the morning, you have to feel very bad, and you fall down, and the security will ask for ambulance for you. And you are going to the hospital, and you need to stay overnight. And when they release you in the morning, I want the papers. <laughs> and after two days, he came with the papers, and they changed the name, <laughs> Ricardo Clement. Wow. So they brought him as a sick crew member, and they uh, they drove directly to the uh, to the plane. And he was drugged. Yeah. He was he drugged. And tell us, this is what this is. That's the needle. This is the needle that drugged. That's him. the needle that uh, <coughs> the doctor that took part in the operation. Uh, Weiss. Unfortunately, uh, Yona. Yeah, Yonel Yan, uh, by the way, in the movie, he became a blonde, lovely girl. Lovely. Which I understand his family isn't happy about. Yes. 
Yes, they don't talk with They took, her, Hollywood took artistic license and made her attractive blonde, and so, so now that family's upset. So he committed suicide, unfortunately, f six years ago, and I got phone call from the deputy of Mossad, I want you to bring this needle from yeah. the family. And but also you have the goggles. Yes, the you goggles can, I you found. You can see the goggles at the, at the exhibit also. Three years ago I found the goggles. <clears throat> and this is a rare picture that Svi Aroni made. You know, usually the Mossad don't, uh, usually the Mossad agent bring a, a, a personal private camera and they make some pictures. So <clears throat> that's why I got it from the family. It's not official for Mossad. All right, let's just finish up some of these photos. This is yes. the man in the glass booth. That's Eichmann in Jerusalem. On the far right up here, this is Gideon Hauser, another hero of Eli Rosenbaum. He was the attorney general. Look at the policeman. <clears throat> the key to the thing, Avner loves this anecdote, so I'll help deliver it. Notice that the policemen have mustaches. And yes. Avner, tell us why this is because the people Because all, all of them <clears throat> were Sephardic. And you know why Sephardic? Because they don't relate it to the Holocaust. Because if you put two Ashkenazi together with him, they will kill him. They will not protect him. <laughs> And the mission, you know, you cannot make a trial with a dead body. So, so they put this far. And now, when I was in Cleveland last year, I got a phone call from a guy, and he told me my father was one of the policemen, and uh, he passed away. And I have the suit, so you can see you can see the suit mm -hmm. here. I told him, "Are you Sephardic?" Yes, he said, "My my my, my father came from Iraq." So. This is the story about. And the man on the yeah, lower right? Mickey Goldman. Mickey Goldman, and you see the number that was um, tattooed on his arm at Auschwitz. And he was also testified. He, he didn't testify, but he was the subject of testimony. He was a member right. of the special Israeli police. police unit that investigated the case. Right. In the, in the he movie, was just we, here in New York. In the movie, we got this tattoo, and they asked me for a number. I called a friend of mine that lost uh, a lot of uh, family members in the Holocaust in, from Hungary. I told him I want you to give me your father number. So I took the number, mm. and he needed to, to, uh, to, to sign a, a five pages uh, MGM agreement, mm -hmm. and the number is in the movie, the real number. All right, and this is uh, the, our last photo. Yes. Uh, this is actually Avner with all the movie stars. Ben Kingsey here. Actually, on the left up, you can see the, you can see also Michael, me and Michael. Yeah, that's you, right? The, we are waiting to the trial, you see? We took part in the trial. So you're going to be able to all see this movie eventually, yes. MGM. Um, I don't know if we can get, can we get that first shot? Oh, uh, there we go. That's what I want. Oh. So uh, just briefly, the trial, uh, let's talk a little about that. Um, uh, and Eli, you should jump in. I mean, I, I took some Your notes. Your family didn't talk about the Holocaust. No, that's why I do this for a living. <laughs> That's what happens. This is true. They do not. They did not. Uh, Israel's only case of capital punishment was Eichmann. I love that anecdote about saying Ben Gurion says we don't want to hang two, hang one. Um, <clears throat> uh, Eichmann uh, never uh, admitted any personal guilt. Uh, uh, he just following orders. Just following orders. Uh, small cog in the machine. Small cog, small in, the cog machine. in the machine. Again, right. Eli can explain this, and I, for decades of my students, know. Uh, that, that excuse didn't work at Nuremberg either. So there was already precedent that just following orders is not an excuse. Um, uh, but he did, he did confess that he was in charge of the transports. Yes. He, 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 he acknowledged his organizational responsibility as the guy who perfected the efficiency of the German system. But he was very proud of that. Uh, but, but not, in, not in the courtroom, but yes. Not in before the courtroom. Before that. He, uh, they, the, the Israeli Supreme Court, Eli, does not find him personally guilty, if I remember. They, they held him only responsible, again, for the org of killing anyone in particular, right? There was no finding that a, the final solution was his, his idea, so to speak. Or that he ever but, fired a gun at somebody. Right, but he Never. was a, a principal <laughs> implementer of the plan to exterminate uh, the Jews of Europe, and right. that was confirmed by, by, the, by the court. This was you know, a trial that completely mesmerized the world. It was the first televised trial in world history. Uh, with all due respect to uh, folks who used to say that the O.J. Simpson trial was yeah. the trial of the century. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll probably go with Nuremberg on that, but after that, it's going to be the Eichmann trial. Um, it was a major change in the way atrocity trials were presented. 
Nuremberg and its progeny tended to rely on captured documents. There were hardly any uh, survivor type witnesses at the first Nuremberg trial. Now why was that? I'm not sure why that, I, I think they, they, they wanted primarily to convict these people based on their own words that they, they couldn't um, escape from. Also there weren't uh, so many witnesses available uh, as to the actions of, say, a Goering or, you know, the, all these top-level Nazi officials. There are, there, yeah, there are people who also think that they didn't want to make it too Jewish. But I was about to say also the Holocaust was certainly not the focus of the Nuremberg trial. It wasn't, it was wasn't, covered. The Holocaust was not the basis of the Nuremberg. Right. It was covered, but it was certainly not, not, not the focus. This trial, of course, very different. The Shoah was the focus of the trial, and somewhat controversially, uh, Gideon Hausner decided to present the entire story, so to speak, of the Holocaust, not just those parts for which, which Eichmann was which responsible. Which Eichmann's attorneys objected to. And even the judges had limited patience for, but it was a tremendous service, uh, I think, to humanity. Because th this way, the Holocaust was on trial itself, not just Eichmann. And it taught a new generation about the, the crimes that had been committed. I would submit that it moved the Holocaust uh, to the central position of world uh, public discourse and scholarly discourse on the subject of the crimes of the Nazis. They weren't just, it wasn't just a piece of, of what the Nazis did along with other crimes against humanity, uh, with war crimes and, and uh, uh, aggressive war. This was their most infamous, most horrible uh, crime of all, and this is really now sort of what the, the Nazis are known for. In, in our prosecutions at the Justice Department, we have kind of a, tried to adopt the best of both worlds, so our cases have been based on documents, but also in virtually every case, almost every case, we have uh, brought survivors to the courtroom. These are some of the bravest people I've I've ever met in my life, people who are willing to reopen these psychological wounds uh, that can't ever heal, um, as you've written about so eloquently, uh, and they, they testify so that judges um, who have never experienced anything remotely approximating uh, the Holocaust uh, can begin to understand the reality of these crimes as they were experienced at the time on the ground, so to speak. There is a yet another argument about Nuremberg and about why they didn't rely on survivor testimony in addition to the ones that we just discussed. And that, in, and this I know is fascinating to you because you've never deployed this idea that we don't trust people that are too emotional. That we don't trust you because you've lived this horrendous thing and we don't know if we can, I mean, you know, even uh, historians, historically, when it came to understanding the Holocaust, we're much more interested in interviewing the perpetrators than the victims. It's twisted. <clears throat> it's totally twisted. But, it's but to say, we don't think you're going to tell absolutely the truth because you're so overwhelmed, and not unlike Avner's point about the mustaches. Mm -hmm. We don't want Ashkenazi Jews behind Eichmann because they'll strangle him. And that was another thing that the trial changed. Not only did it move the Holocaust to the central focus, to be the central focus of discussion of Nazi crimes, it moved survivor remembrances right. to the heart of that conversation. Right, and fact, where, where, it, where they are to this right, very day. Right, the Shoah Foundation's, uh, the Fortune Off Testament oral histories, probably none of that would have happened. Um, I have uh, two more questions, one for each of you, and then we'll take something from the audience. Uh, so this goes a little to the sort of the legacy of, 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 of the Eichmann trial. <clears throat> You've now curated 25. Uh, are you of the view that this was the signature Mossad operation? Remember, it has a lot to compete with. The Raid on Antebi, it, by the way, is also coming out as a film in the next month Not or two. If he tells us, he may have to kill us. Yeah, see, this guy doesn't look like he Be kills. careful what you Just ask. Saying. One thing, he's too nice to kill. Uh, but Antebi's coming out as a film. Uh, <clears throat> the, the Mossad's uh, bombing of an uh, Iraqi nuclear reactor, right? Uh, there's been a number of these, of course, all the, mil the, uh, the, the, the post-Munich hits. Bringing the Jews from Ethiopia. Oh, the Ethiopian rescue mission. Yes. Where, where, does this one, where does this one fit in your mind? Who, Antebe? No, this, uh, Operation Finale. Is this Israel's signature, Mossad's signature achievement? For the reasons that <clears throat> Eli said that the, even the CIA couldn't believe this? 
it's, it's the first time that the Mossad made a big operation like this and, uh, <coughs> and I think that because it's related to the trial and related to the Holocaust and in Israel uh, <coughs> we have the left and we have the right but in still today when you talk about the Holocaust we are all together and think about me that my parents came from Iraq and I'm feeling like a Holocaust survivor. And I think that today... And you devoted your life to this now. Yes. Right. I devoted my life to New York. <laughs> but the Holocaust survivors be became very old and they, they cannot talk and tell the story and we need to find a new way. So here we, in the Jewish Heritage Museum, uh, I can say we have, uh, uh, beside this exhibit, also a special exhibition that you can talk with the Holocaust survivor, hmm. uh, talking with the screen, but it's, it's, it's a new technology that you can... Uh, and that'll, it's part of this exhibit? Yeah, no, it's not. It's, it's oh. the other exhibit. Oh, it's another exhibit. And uh, I would like also to mention a good friend of mine, Sami. Can you stand up, Sami? Sami is a Holocaust survivor, but he cannot remember anything. <laughs> he cannot remember he was two years old. And the Nazis used to take him from his mother every day to make an uh, experience. Mm. Anyway, I, I mention him because uh, if you can talk with him after, uh, he will agree to give you a special tour if you're coming during <coughs> this week. Talk with him because he's making a lot of special tours and uh, he's really number one. Thank you, Sami. Yeah. <coughs> um, <laughs> there's just so much uh, to talk about, just briefly. Uh, after the Israelis left in the, uh, with the, the El Al flight, three Israeli Mossad agents stayed yeah. behind. Stayed, yeah, yeah. And they continued to look for Eich, for, no, for, for Mengele. Mengele. For yeah. Mengele. <clears throat> so think about it. I mean, at this point, this became this international sensation. <clears throat> There's all of a sudden UN resolutions condemning this tiny Israel for invading this territorial sovereignty of Argentina. <clears throat> and three Mossad agents are still walking around trying to find Mengele. They, they never gave up. I <clears throat> think that, I don't, I'm sure that Ben-Gurion made his announcement too early. He asked the head of Mossad how many people know that Eichmann in Israel, he said 50. So he told him together with the wife it's 100. In Israel, 100 people, less than an hour, will talk about. <laughs> so I'm going to make an announcement. Anyway. Uh, so had he waited? What do you think would have happened? I'm talking about now the three agents taking bus in Brazil, and they saw someone holding a newspaper with a picture of Eichmann on the front page, and they realized that the story is out and they need to go home, okay? So that's why we uh, need to, to cancel the Mengele operation. Uh, because they, they, that's they, how they learned, because they didn't have a cell phone. But Mengele didn't disappear because of Ben-Gurion uh, announcement. Mengele disappeared because all the, all the Nazis community knew about that Eichmann uh, disappeared and they tried to find him. And I think that in this point, during the 10 days, he disappeared. So Eli, which anecdote would you like to tell the audience? The Otto Albrecht von Bolschwink or the Simon Wiesenthal uh, World Jewish Congress anecdote? Which well, is your favorite? I, th I think I'll, I'll go with the von Bolschwing. Um, okay. uh, Otto Albrecht von Bolschwing was uh, mm -hmm. one of the first um, people we prosecuted when my office was established in 1979, my former office, OSI. Um, we found him on our own. Uh, he had been an advisor to Eichmann uh, before and during the war and was responsible for a number of anti-Jewish initiatives, so to speak, that um, Eichmann uh, adopted. Um, after the war, and we can say it now, he uh, was employed by the CIA uh, he came to the United States, as you might imagine. He was very concerned when uh, Eichmann was captured and, and brought to trial in Israel. Uh, there were concerns at the CIA as well, um, not only about him, but about uh, the uh, West German government, uh, particularly since um, one of the senior aides to the German chancellor, uh, Konrad Adenauer, uh, uh, Hans Globke, had a Nazi past, uh, and it, um, the CIA took that concern to the point of prevailing upon Life magazine, which uh, before the Eichmann trial had the uh, world exclusive publication rights 
to Eichmann's uh, Argentinian memoirs persuaded life to delete any, any reference to, to Globkin. Hmm. Um, this is something you and I have talked about for many years. Um, so your office starts in 1979. The, arc, the, 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 the people that pushed the Nuremberg trials was the United States, the Allied powers. We were the focus of that. Mm -hmm. we, were, we had the chief prosecutor, former Supreme Court judge, existing Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson. After Nuremberg, the Israelis put together a statute that says, if we ever find a Nazi, they had other reasons for it, Nazi collaborators, we will have the underlying subject matter jurisdiction, substantive criminal law to prosecute. The United States doesn't do that. The United States creates instead the Displaced Persons Act, which says, <laughs> along with the Holtzman Amendment, that's named for Elizabeth Holtzman, who used to be a congresswoman here in, in Brooklyn, that if we- Talk about heroes, yes. Another okay. hero, a Liz, something we don't remember about Liz, but we should, the Holtzman Amendment, which says, if you are a Nazi and we find out that you lied on your naturalization application for a visa and you procured your visa illegally, we will denaturalize and deport you. Why didn't we just create language, statutes, just like the Israelis did? Why did you spend your career deporting people instead of either killing them or at least, or at least, and I mean, I don't mean, I don't mean that casually. I mean that directly, killing them. Uh, you know, because I do think, and I've written a book about revenge, and I think it does raise an interesting question: Had Eichmann been shot out of the bus instead of put on a trial, would it have been less moral to do it that way? It might have provided. It would have been not sensational. The world wouldn't have learned the lessons of the Holocaust. Oral testimonies would not have been, you know, all of the things you've just said, but it wouldn't be the first targeted assassination. Certainly, President Obama knows about that. Uh, our on Lockheed was killed that way. We did not kidnap uh, Osama bin Laden and put him on trial. We did not kidnap on Lockheed and put him on trial. We just, sh just used a drone. So the Israelis here make a decision. No, we're, we're gonna go to the trouble to drug them, fake everyone out <laughs> with an empty LL plane, and bring him there. Did, tell us to, if you know. Sure. Yeah. Well, of course, by 1960 and 59, uh, Eichmann was not a threat to, to humanity the way Osama bin Laden was and al um, uh, So those aren't strictly comparable situations. So, you know, for another day, we could discuss the advantages of yeah. adhering to the rule of law, which are substantial for so many reasons. Um, I do want to say that the reason that we don't have a criminal statute in the United States uh, that covers World War II Nazi crimes is because we have this wonderful old document, as you know, the United States Constitution, that prohibits the enactment of ex post facto laws. This was not a problem in Israel because they didn't have a constitution. But we I think they still don't. But we um, ignored it at Nuremberg because which we was wasn't... Not Right. But, but you, who were we right. to ignore ex post facto legislation when, in fact, we're the architects of that? And, and in worked. fact, the German defense attorneys made that argument. And it worked, you know, for an international tribunal. We were prepared to accept that. It was not governed by U.S. law, but as a practical matter. You, you all understand what we're talking about, here. just briefly, just because I think we're talking professorially here, just so you'll know. The Constitution says, as an ex post facto uh, part of the Constitution, which essentially says you can't punish, be punished for a crime that wasn't a crime at the time you committed it. And there which is a arguments. great idea, except when you're dealing with Nazis. Uh, and when you're uh, dealing with genocide. And there, there it's are. It's a real problem because the Nazis' position was at Nuremberg where he said, whoa, there was no anti genocide law at the time we did this. And so therefore, you Americans know about this ex post facto law. You can't punish me for a crime that didn't, wasn't a crime at the time that I committed. Even if I did commit it, it wasn't criminal at that time. And there are scholars who, who posit that uh, had Congress passed a criminal law, despite the ex post facto law, it might have been constitutional. The House Judiciary Committee uh, considered that possibility and decided it was too, too risky. Um, and therefore, we don't have that law. All right, we're gonna take one question. By the way, anecdote for, for the law, yeah. since you came from the law. It was so important, the Eichmann trial, that when, the, when his lawyer used to come for vacations and he landed in Cologne, 
the Mossad agent used to wait for him in the, in the airport and follow him in Germany just to make sure that nothing happened to him. Ah. That he will come back and will continue. Ah. All right, we're going to let Eli have the last word. It's ah. actually based on a, one of the questions. Uh, uh, it's funny, when I've had Eli talk to my students, he always used, you didn't, I, tr I fed you this, you didn't take the one. Oh. He usually says to them, because we take the position in the United States that if you're, it, given the crimes that you've committed, we deem you unfit to walk our streets and breathe our air. Which sounds great, but I always find that unsatisfying. I think killing Nazis are still better. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so uh, give us one anecdote. Uh, and you know which one I, this person wants uh -oh. to know about the numbers of, what's your favorite of the cases over your 30 years? Wow. You might have your own, but do you, would you have any interest in telling the Vitas Garolitis story? I could tell that. The Vitas Garolitis story it's is It's a New York story. Remember Vitas Garolitis? The famous a... tennis player is, is of interest perhaps to New Yorkers because he lived but here. But it's not your favorite. And it's not my favorite. His grandfather turned out to be a major Nazi war criminal who couldn't be prosecuted uh, for, anyway, um, but who was very much in the news after he was exposed in the 1970s. Um, the strange thing about Gerolitis, I remember, he's no longer alive, is that he got into a public controversy when he got angry at a, a, line, uh, judge. a line judge at Forest Hills who the tennis was Jewish, judge. and perhaps he knew because he exclaimed to the press afterwards that that man should be thrown in an oven and burned to death. Oh. That's pretty severe uh, punishment. That was, in those days, you, there was no politically correctness, but, but that's very politically incorrect. If you'll permit me to end with two quick anecdotes. No, 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 you can't. You I can't, can't finish okay. the garolitis. Does anyone know how a garolitis oh. died? Carbon monoxide poisoning. A gas Just accident. So I, now, I always wondered whether Mossad did that. Two very quick Eichmann anecdotes that I, one is I had the great privilege of knowing both Issa Harrell, uh, whose grandson is here, I look forward to meeting him, and Peter Malkin, who grabbed uh, uh, Eichmann. Uh, I remember having breakfast with Harrell in the 1990s in Tel Aviv, and then we left together in a taxi. Uh, people in Israel have the same healthy disrespect for government officials that we have here, uh, but we get in the cab, and there's an older cab driver, and after a few seconds, he does a double take, and he asks the man next to me in, in, in Hebrew, and I know enough to understand this, he said, are, are you Issa Harrell? And very modestly, Harrell says, yes. Well, the man went, you know, Nazi was so proud to have the great Issa Harrell in his cab. And it's the only time in my life that a cab driver, I have witnessed a cab driver refuse to accept a fare. <laughs> he would not let us pay. The other is Peter Malkin, who used to tell the story when asked, well, what was the thing you were most worried about in terms of failure of the Eichmann mission? And he said, frankly, my fear was living in a small country like Israel, everybody would learn that I had failed and they would point me out and say, see that guy? Yeah. That's the man who almost caught Eichmann. Good <laughs> guy, but he couldn't do it. I, I can say that Malkin was here in a, in a, in a foreign uh, embassy. No, no, I think in Tel Aviv. He came to one of the Romanian embassy or something like this and he told the ambassador, ambassador, this is the first time that entering to the embassy from the main door. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the talk show is, we're about to say goodnight. Uh, I want you to really encourage you to go see the exhibit. Uh, I hope it's we, amazing. I hope we enticed you to see it. Yes, sir, you seem to want to say something. Yeah, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Emmanuel Wurm, I was at Eichmann trial. Wow. And later on I went to Germany to make 30 films about the Holocaust and also fought under the two Nazis. One of them was the mistress of Adolf Eichmann, who served as a Nazi woman in concentration camp Zerebic. Oh. And she was willing to talk in my workshop films, all Jews out, uh, about wow. her relationship to Adolf. Wow. And uh, she knew, and she said in the film, she knew that Adolf Eichmann came to Theresienstadt uh, for four days to organize the deportation. And of course, she knew, and she said in the film, she knew that the Jews were claimed to be bad. And okay. And I think Amazing. you will agree that other than, uh, uh, unlike uh, Hannah Arendt, 
it's who should be mentioned again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> everyone who actually encountered Eichmann during the war, who would speak about it afterwards, agreed that he was tenaciously dedicated to exterminating every Jewish human and being. And yet Hannah Arendt saw something else. How was that possible? We want to say good night to Eli Rosenbaum and Avner Avraham.